everybody or good evening wherever you're from. We're going to start with a definition of comics done by Scott McCloud in his book Understanding Comics. Uh, he talks about comics as being a sequential visual arts form. Uh, he goes on to change the definition bit by bit and uh, he kind of compares movies to so yeah there's there's a lot of things going on here static images uh and then one person's like what about like when we write words isn't that the same thing uh he also has details about hieroglyphs and other paintings from different cultures uh this is a really good book which has a lot of definitions and criticism on the art form of comics beyond the superheroes and stuff and um i j i just wanted to shoot this part of the video in in person because of all these resources that i have but yeah today we're going to talk about comic books and the use of music in them all right so unless you're talking about a christmas card that has pop-ups in it Comic books are not the first thing that come to mind when you think about sound, because you can do a lot inside a comic book, but uh, not the use of sound, unless, you know, a bam or a whoosh or a... Uh, there's always the use of sound in comics, as you can see in my other book. These are... There's jargon for it, too. There's... Um, so like if you use this kind of a box you're you're giving this sort of an emotion to people and uh, the flash for example would zoom or swoosh and those lines behind him and then there's like you know other sounds like crack crash all that so yeah you can produce sound inside a comic book and once again, according to Scott McNeil, comics are the closest thing to cinema, if you think about it, because all movies, they start out as a storyboard, even an advertisement, even an animation, you would have several panels of storyboard and like some of the most famous comic book artists were also people who used to do. All right, so this one is by Denny O'Neill who was a writer, but his partner, Neil Adams, was actually in the business of advertising and illustration before he moved on to comics. And he did a, such amazing work with Green Lantern, with Batman, with a lot of characters. All right, so I'm gonna give you three examples of how music, not just sound, but music, like songs and popular culture, how these have been incorporated into comics. So I'm going to start with, I'm going to tell you about the Dark X-Men next. I'm going to tell you about this scene from Daredevil, just so you know what's going to come after that. Most of it is going to be like, you know, it's going to be like the panels with the audio in the background. This is half and half, a little bit of actual video with me in it. I feel like when I'm actually present, it feels more engaging. But you guys don't need to see my face to absorb the information. So I've been doing the uh, other kind of one more. But since I have the book, I'll just show you how. So this is Inferno. This is the story where uh, the queen of gob the goblin queen, this one right here, uh, next to uh, Sinister. This is the one where Madeline Pryor, clone of Jean Grey, slowly goes crazy and becomes a supervillain. She's actually a good character. She's actually a very loving and trustworthy friend. She was also a clone because, you know, Sinister is a dick. But, all right, so she makes the moves on Havoc, which is the brother of Cyclops. Madeline Pryor and Cyclops had a baby while Cyclops thought that Jean Grey was dead. But when Jean Grey returned, he chose Jean Grey over Madeline Pryor, which is actually, I mean, she got served wrong, Madeline Pryor. 
So here she is making the moves on Havoc, who is at this moment having a dream about dancing with the love of his life, Lorna Dane. That is Polaris from X Factor 1. And over here in these two panels, you can see a little song playing on the radio. So he's he's relaxing in the sun with a drink, and there's a radio on this panel. And it goes, Devil with the blue dress, blue dress, blue dress, devil with the blue dress on. Devil with the blue dress, blue dress, blue dress, devil with the blue dress on. So this actually provides some background music to the scene as uh, Madeline Pryor walks up in yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna show you better pictures of color. I feel like the color actually takes away from the lines and the detail of some of the art. So I prefer black and white. But this one, uh, you have to see the color to understand what's going on. So he's relaxing in the sun, having these thoughts about Lorna Dane, and then Madeline Pryor comes out and she's wearing a blue dress. And she's being a little seductive. She's uh, her intentions at this point are like you know she's just trying to get back at Cyclops, or she's trying to get something for herself because she feels like that she has lost or she has been s deprived of or stolen of, uh, uh, being robbed of her rightful life. Uh, and and she's okay with Cyclops settling with Jean Grey because, you know, they were a couple from before and she's just an imitation of Jean Grey. She's come to an understanding, but she's also like, you know, what about me? So in this state of mind, she goes after Havoc. And they they actually use the music a little bit to give us a mood, to set a mood about, like, you know, how evil this person is. Like, she hasn't become completely evil yet. But it is foreshadowed throughout this many thick pages. There's uh, about ten or twelve books in this volume. So, and and some of them are X Men, some of them are X Factor. One's an annual. So, you got you got this uh, foreshadowing thing, as I told about um, Madeline Pryor turning into an evil person. And this is right before she reveals herself. She's already made a deal with the devil, I think, by this point. But this is right before the entire city of New York turns into like a zombie playground where, you know, post boxes come to life and everything. Uh, so it's it's kind of a pivotal moment in the series. And the song kind of puts us in we get an understanding of how evil she is under the clothes and stuff. Which also has a lot to do with the personal ideas of Chris Claremont. Earlier in this saga, uh, we fight the swarm, and there's a moment where Wolverine has a moment of Christian faith or doubt, because uh, he's a very religious person. But Chris Claremont incorporates a lot of religion into his comics like Dole, Apocalypse and the Forces uh, uh, the Horses of uh, Apocalypse, the Four Horses. Um, Exodus, a lot of the biblical terms used in um, Inferno, I think, might also be a biblical term. Nathan, Daniel, yeah. Uh, Cable's real name is Nathaniel, so that's that's there too. All right, let's get into the next bit, which is which is the Dark X Men and the Dark Avengers, where every character has a unique theme song for themselves. Omega here as well as Mimic. Uh, Mimic is the fifth. X-Men or the sixth X-Men that was introduced, I think, right after the original five. And he's kind of like Morph in that, well, Mimic and Morph are a little different. Morph can change into anything he wants to. Mimic is kind of stuck 
in the state, but he has powers of all the X-Men. He has the wings of Angel, the visual or optical blasts of Cyclops, and I think the hands and paws of Beast, maybe. The ice powers and telekinesis, telepathy of the other two X-Men, maybe. So yeah, the song that they've given to him is You can't always get what you want But if you try sometimes That's, um, <clears throat> it's a Rolling Stones song And, uh, as I will show you in the next couple of panels Each character has a song about them or a song named after them you wouldn't say the song was named after them because the song is obviously older but yeah you got um so the original rolling stone song would go something like this i saw her at the reception glass of wine in her hand so we're talking about a girl that he used to love or he used to be in love with maybe the girl was into him as well they had a relationship but now he's marrying some other guy or she's marrying some other guy and this guy's like you can't always get what you want but if you try sometimes you can but it's mimic song because he literally has all the powers of the other X-Men, like, he has the best of all worlds, he has the wings of Angel, he has the optic blasts of Cyclops, you know? And I'm not sure what Tumbling Dice is, uh, the song that's given to Omega, the other character in this uh, panel, but when we go on to the next one, we see Nate Gray, which is the Apocalypse uh, Age of Apocalypse version of you couldn't really say that he's he is another version of Cable because he comes from the same parents but at the same time he's different from Cable so anyway this guy he was raised in I think a lab or like he was broken out of an experimental facility when he was he was sort of cloned to life or birthed in an artificial chamber. I'm not exactly sure what his deal is, but he has some sort of innocence and in this particular story, which is I think uncanny X-Men or something, in this particular story this guy has kind of taken over the world and believes in... No, that's not the story. Anyways, uh, they've given him the child... Uh, the Man with the Child in His Eyes by Kate Bush. The Man with the Child in His Eyes. No, oh, wait. I'm still stuck on the Rolling Stones song. Uh, it was one of Kate Bush's first songs, I believe, uh, right next to the Wuthering Heights one. So, yeah, moving on to Norman Osborn. Norman Osborn's been given the song. <clears throat> uh, yeah, these are the lyrics from... Uh, the Devil's Advocate, no wait, uh, Sympathy for the Devil. The title of the song is Sympathy for the Devil. These are the first lines. It goes like, Please allow me to introduce myself. I'm a man of wealth and taste. Been around for long, long years. Da -da 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 -da. Killed the Tsar and the ministers. Anastasia. Cried in vain. Uh, so he talks about the Blitzkrieg. He talks about the SARS. He's, talk he's talking about Jesus. And he's implying that he's the devil. And he says, Pleased to meet you. Hope you guessed my name. But what's puzzling you Is the nature of my game. 
I think it goes very well with the Iron Patriot or Norman Osborn. Okay, so a little backstory. If you don't know what Dark X-Men and Dark Avengers are, um, I think the events of Dark X-Men, Dark Avengers was brought around right after Civil War or something like that. Not exactly sure. Norman Osborn is supposed to be reformed, but he is not. Spoiler. And he dons the armor of Super Patriot, which is an Iron Man-esque armor with the colors of Captain America and the flag of America. So it's a combination of Captain America and Iron Man, which is why I think it comes straight out of Civil War, but I'm not sure. This is a comic that was made in the digital age. As you can see, the pictures are all very artificial AI looking stuff made on the computers. So this is obviously post 2000s, but the music that's used, um, Rolling Stones and Kate Bush were both musicians that these songs were released in 1976 or 1972 or something like that. All of these songs are from the same 70s era. So they're taking you back to the 70s, which is when the X-Men were first popularized, right? I think I think they first had their maybe they came out in the 60s or the 40s but it wasn't really until the 70s that the X-Men were fleshed out into what we know them as today. So this is the power of music. This is what I wanted to talk to you about. This is a neat trick where the writer kind of uses your database, your depth of knowledge and it draws on whatever you know these songs if you have heard of them before and they're hard to miss because it's the Rolling Stones one of the biggest bands in America and Kate Bush which I hadn't heard of Kate Bush until 2012 or 14 at least and then I listened to some of her songs Wuthering Heights and Man with the Child in His Eyes. Um, the songs that are... So here's the Dark X-Men. These are the Dark X-Men. We got Moonstone playing Miss Marvel. We got... Okay, Venom over here is actually Scorpion, uh, the Spider-Man villain. And then Hawkeye is actually a reformed bullseye. Spoiler alert, Bullseye isn't reformed either. And then you got Sentry. So I did some digging around with these songs. I actually didn't know any of these songs except for Them Heavy People. Them Heavy People goes like, Roll in the ball, roll in the ball to me. Dee -dee -dee. Them Heavy People and me hit a soft spot. So She's basically, I think, talking about psychological issues or something in basic, uh, in heavy people, which it's a loony bin. And Moonstone is actually a psychologist who is analyzing the team on the job. It's very cool. Um, you got for Wolverine's son, Deken, you got the architect's dream. Which, ironically enough, the words in the song, the lyrics in the song, actually tell you about, what is it, a painter painting, watching the painter painting, and, you know, the painter makes a small mistake over there, his hand was shaky or something, but the title is The Architect's Dream. So I'm guessing it's implied that the architect is someone who can't really afford to make mistakes. The architect is a perfectionist and everything is mathematical in his designs, right? Whereas the painter can paint whatever they want, freeform. It still has to be a good painting and all, but the techniques that the painter uses 
is different from how the architect draws. So maybe they're saying Duncan is so flawless, but he kind of subconsciously wishes that he could make some mistakes and live the way he wants, uh, which is kind of implied in this one comic where he's uh, standing in Norman Osborne's office, looking through the glass windows at the city below him. And he's like, I'm invisible to all these people. They don't even know I exist, but I can achieve so much more if, like, you know, my potential is so great, he believes. So maybe that's what Architect's Dream is supposed to tell you about the character. It really just like, you know, it's just one picture, one word, but it's so dense. You're going to draw out from what you know about this song from popular culture and put it into, especially like, you know, with regard to Norman Osborne's song, Man of Wealth and Taste, the dev, uh, Sympathy for the Devil. You got to know what the Blitzkrieg is. You got to know what a czar is. You got to know different things from different points in history and connect them all together to understand something about the song. And then what uh, the chorus says about his game. Hope you guess my name, but what's puzzling you is the nature of my game. It kind of connects to Norman Osborn because he's wearing a Iron Patriot suit covering up the man inside. He is no longer wearing the Green Goblin outfit, but he is still essentially the same man as Green Goblin. So he's moonlighting as a different character, and even after you've figured out who he really is, even after you've found out his true identity, you still don't know whether he is acting on good intentions or bad intentions. And then... All right, so the Sentry, all these songs over here are Kate Bush songs. Them Heavy People is there, Architect's Dream. And then you got under Sentry's name, Be Kind to My Mistakes. I kind of did some digging around, and turns out this song was featured in a movie called Castaway about a couple of British people living in Papua New Guinea or an island off of Papua New Guinea. Um, at the end of the movie, the man tells the woman, when you're writing about me, because, you know, the woman's going to write a memoir about their time together on this island uh, for two years as a married couple. And he says, when you write about me, be kind to my mistakes. And one of the lines is, we both have secrets, you and I, or something. And if you know something about the sentry, so there's this scene in the Dark X-Men or Dark Avengers where Bullseye, the new Hawkeye, is escorting the Sentry's, the, the love of Sentry's life. I don't know if it's actually his girlfriend or his wife. Someone that is very important to the Sentry is being escorted and you got to read that part. It really shows uh, something about the relationship between Sentry and his girlfriend. Also, it shows something about Bullseye and how Bullseye will never change. All right. So that's section two. And... Next is section three, which I think is one of the most effective uses of music and comics. The year is, I believe, 2008 or 2005. I'm not 100% sure. It's actually a few years before Civil War, and we got Daredevil fighting Nitro. So what happens is Daredevil is walking out of the courthouse with Foggy after one of the biggest wins in the history of whatever, whatever. 
This is actually a scene that's also present in Daredevil, actually the Defenders, Netflix's Defenders. Uh, this, this scene is there in Matt's thing. So yeah, he wins something, he comes out of the courthouse and there's, well, first of all, there's cameras and flashing lights and click, click, click and people asking questions. A lot of, it's, it's a busy town. There's always some noise going on, whether it's auditory noise or, so it's not just things that you hear, it's things that you see and smell as well. And then suddenly, there's a huge explosion. There's an explosion, and now poor Matt, Daredevil, is left overloaded with senses. Uh, he's complaining about how everything is too loud, and he's still in shock after the bomb. Now he starts to get back into, uh, what is it called, like, awareness. So he, he starts getting awareness of his surroundings again. And one thing you got to know about Daredevil is he has heightened senses, right? So he's, he's able to hear things that we may not be able to hear close by. And he's able to smell things more acutely, whatever. And so once again, this is how the author manages to get you into the mood that he wants you to be in to read this comic. He delves into the depths of your mind, makes you think of several things, like he gives you the stimulus for several things. Now one of these things is Peter Frampton's Oh baby I love your way every day, yeah yeah, or well, he also mentioned Springsteen here. Remember how we were talking about the Rolling Stones just a minute ago? One of their... So, Sympathy for the Devil, I mentioned that one. It's probably one of my favorite ones. Also, uh, the one about Mystique. So, there's... Uh, Mystique is also in the Dark X-Men comic, which I forgot to mention earlier. In that one, they sing Ruby Tuesday is Mystique's song. Ruby Tuesday kind of goes like this. Don't ask her where she's from. Do, do, do. She never tells about where she's from. Yesterday is history if it's gone. Yesterday don't matter if it's gone. Goodbye, Ruby Tuesday. Who could hang a name on you when you change with every new day? Girl, I'm gonna miss you. So, Mystique is a shapeshifter. Not only are her powers in shapeshifting, but she was also at one point a spy for the CIA, a double agent. Mystique has been in several places as several people using several faces, and she's much older than you would guess. So it kind of goes with that. Now, Peter Frampton and Bruce Springsteen. Oh, yeah. So. Remember how we were talking about uh, Sympathy for the Devil, right? Rolling Stones, that album starts with, uh, well, first of all, it starts with I Can't Get No Satisfaction, and then after that, it goes into Painted Black. Painted Black is, well, I mean, to me, it reminds me of the Vietnam War, because I used to watch a show when I was a kid uh, called... Call of Duty, no, no, that, that was a video game. Uh, it was set in, you know, Vietnam War times. It was called Medal of Honor, Call of Duty, Honor, Duty, something. And this would be theme song for it. But yeah, in that song, 
uh, Mick Jagger's talking about a person who hates everything. He doesn't want any colors. He wants red gone. He wanted it replaced with black. No colors anymore. And they also talk about flowers, uh, pretty girls in summer dresses, line of cars, babies, uh, babies, flowers, colors, all these things that are usually positive in our minds. But this person is talking about them in a negative way. Same here. Uh, our hero, Matt is talking about Bruce Springsteen and Peter Frampton, who I'm sure are pretty popular musicians. But yeah, he's complaining about how much he hates them. But, you know, there's action going on. And we're told about these songs. And we're given lights from these songs. Um, so... You kind of played in your mind while the fight is going on, while the action is going on. So the action progresses from left to right in the panels and from top to bottom on a page and across several pages in a book. And then the song continues from one place to another, from the end of one book to the other. So it, it goes through certain panels. Uh, it's the same song, whereas earlier we had one panel, one song, and we had people with uh, with with certain certain names and titles. Yeah, the X Men. If you've read many X Men books, you've probably come across this technique that they use. They got so many characters, and they got so many years behind them. So sometimes you need to reintroduce these characters to people, right? So from time to time in X-Men books, they tell you a little bit of, like, they give you captions for characters. Like, okay, this person, his role is this, his powers are this. And they've gone an extra step by giving them 1976 songs as their theme or their title. Which tells you more about the person than words can. Alright, so, yeah, I mean... In the first example that we looked at, we saw one example of a song. And in the second example, we saw we saw static images of type, like they, they gave us just words, uh, titles of songs, and it was so dense, as I said. There were five people on one page and five songs by the same artist, probably from the same album. But here, we got, we're stretching it out. We're doing it the opposite way. We got one song stretching out across several pages. One song or maybe two, because, you know, Bruce Springsteen is also mentioned. And uh, the artist, the the writer, leave it to Brian Michael Bendis to do stuff like this. It makes you jump around from place to place. It takes your mind to different corners of your uh, own knowledge and draw from things and then before you know it you're in the same mood that the writer is in or the writer has put you in a certain mood i think it's genius so there you have it uh cinema or comics with music in the background i think people get into comics for several reasons making a movie today isn't that difficult because everybody's got cameras and phones and like you know it's easy to make a video but back in the day when you needed all these equipment and stuff and locations and people to do shootings with making a movie was actually tougher and the budget might be beyond you so what they do is if you can't make a movie they settle for a comic i believe that's how they used to do it and grand morrison uh, that's one example where he has been in a band before he moved from Britain or UK and became a comic artist. So yeah, I think uh, comics and music, sometimes they can go hand in hand. Or else music can be used to enhance the flavor of the comic that you're reading. 